Okay, I think we are now live. Uh, this is Nolan with postproduction.com, and I have uh, Pete Caldera and Bruno. Bruno, how do I pronounce your last name properly? Uh, Serge. Serge, okay, <laughs> yeah. cool, excellent. And uh, I guess, well, why don't we do this? Why don't, uh, Bruno, why don't you start, Straff, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then sure. Pete, you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll, we'll start off and go from there. All right. Um, well, uh, a few years ago, uh, I'd say six or seven, I, I just did some low-level uh, assistant composing work for, uh, for uh, Walt Disney, uh, Disney Channel, and DreamWorks. And, uh, and from then on, uh, I, I actually have just been working with independent bands. So, uh, and it's, it's been great. Uh, it gives me a lot more freedom, creatively. <laughs> nice. Nice. And you're located out in uh, Los Angeles, right? In Los Angeles, yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. Well, Pete, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about you. Um, I'm a New York City-based uh, composer and keyboard player. Spent uh, over 20 years playing in like some of the biggest Broadway and off-Broadway shows here in the city, and uh, maybe even longer than that. And then over the past 15 years, I've sort of had a parallel career as a composer for films and television. And um, over the past three years, I've also started being a college educator. I teach uh, music production and film scoring at uh, the Aaron Copeland School of Music at Queens College. Um, but I'm fairly busy doing uh, mostly documentary film work. I have a couple of production companies here that I work with, and I just finished a, um, a short um, stop animation kids horror film, which came out. <laughs> it was it's really, it's really cute. It was really, really, really well done. Like, very diverse, um, very diverse career. I've done a lot of music for sports shows and done a lot of uh, documentary films. Wow, oh, that's cool. I see. I'm still thinking kids horror horror show. <laughs> well, it's you know it's sort of like the night, Nightmare Before Christmas kind of a um, vibe. Although it, it's not anything like that. It's sort of in that ballpark. Uh, it's called the Hol Halloween Prankster. The Halloween yeah. Prankster. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, can we ask when that comes out? Um, not quite sure because uh, they still have a lot of work to do with post production. Um, they still have all the sound design to do. They still have some CGI to finish up. So I'm not quite sure when that's going to be finished. Okay. But I just, the music is definitely finished. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, I tell you what, you know, when you're able to uh, let that out of the bag, definitely keep us posted. <laughs> Love to uh, hear some of the music and put some of that up on the site there at uh, postproduction.com. So can... Oh, I actually have the whole score up on SoundCloud. Oh, on, nice. Uh, okay. So I could send you a link for that. Oh, that would be that would be wonderful. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, why don't we hop right into it and um, and kick it off? I guess maybe Pete, if you want to start it off. I know the first topic that we're kind of talking about is how uh, music technology helps creativity. Um, and you know, Bruno, at the same time, feel free to hop back sure. and forth. So, Pete, why don't you why don't you start it off? Well, there was there was a time not too long ago when I first started playing around with technology back in the mid-1980s that it was very difficult to do anything because all the screens were, were really tiny one one line and try and, and when you were doing when you were sequencing you know it was you had a step time sequence or uh, it was very hard to edit but then now you look at how technology's grown especially over the past five years or so and how um, there are so many great pieces of software that None of them are perfect, but they all are incredible for what they can do. And I feel that once you learn and understand how to use whatever technology you're using to create music, I happen to use Pro Tools as my main writing mm -hmm. tool um, uh, simply because I used to be a Studio Vision Pro user in the 1990s. And uh, after they went bankrupt and went down, I had already known how to use Pro Tools a little bit, and I, did, I was so busy writing uh, production music for uh, Killer Tracks, which is a big library, mm -hmm. that I didn't have time to sit down and learn a new DAW like Logic or Performer or something, and I already knew how to use Pro Tools, and even though the MIDI implementation of Pro Tools was lacking at that point, it's certainly grown to the point now where I have no problems scoring feature films or even recording my own albums using the MIDI on Pro Tools. So the way I feel is that 
you learn how to use the technology so that you don't have to think about it so much and you can concentrate on getting your ideas into the computer and editing and developing and working on them and treating them in different ways. And the things that you can do with audio as well as MIDI information, it, it's just really, when I think about where I started to where it is now, it's just really amazing. And it's helped me grow as a composer as well um, because I find that um, I can try out ideas over and over again with different combinations of instruments and then I learn what, what these things sound like together. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely cool. I totally remember when I started, because I, I do, and I'm not a composer at all, <laughs> as my wife reminds me often, but uh, um, I, uh, I remember just clicking through the different panels. That's know. mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's sweet. I'm just that bad. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I can totally say that. To me, there was nothing more frustrating than having the idea of what I wanted to get out there, and then I'm trying to go through the button panels on my keyboard, getting through, and by the time I got through to where I wanted to get the sound, mm -hmm. it was already gone. Um, Real quick, I want to welcome Bruno, or uh, um, let's see, a, a new joiner to the call here. Uh, go ahead and introduce, introduce yourself. Hi. Um, I'm just trying to get my Google, uh, my Google talk set up, but my, my name is Jeremiah Costello. How are you guys doing? Good. Hi, Sounds good. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Totally. Yep. yep, we got you just fine. Just got you fine, awesome. Jeremiah. Awesome. Yep. Nice. My name well, is Jeremiah Costello. Uh, I'm, I guess I would consider myself a composer. I, I'm pretty new to the game, though. Um, I've always been interested in music. I've been a, a musician most of my life. I've played the guitar um, most of my life. And I've written songs since I was a little kid. But I just recently started finding a new interest in composing. So I'm still fairly new, um, but I, I love doing it. And I'm I'm really excited about it, and I, I, I guess right now I'm, I'm, I'm in the stage of just networking and just getting myself out there. So, um, it's a pleasure to meet you guys, and I'm real interested in what you guys have to say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm all ears. So, nice, uh, nice. Well, wel welcome to the conversation here. We're we just uh, Pete was just telling us about uh, we're we're just kicking it off with how music technology helps creativity. And uh, Pete was just kind of telling a little bit about how he got a start, and or as he was beginning, and how as the technology shifted and made it easier to get the the creativity flowing, um, you know, and that's kind of where where you jumped in. So, okay. um, Bruno, I don't know. Take why don't you take? Yeah. It? I actually I agree with Pete on a lot of things, and it, definitely it's a tool. It, the technology is a tool, at least for now. I mean, Ray Kurzweil says that it, it's definitely an exponential evolution of a of a technological progress. So. Um, at least for now, we can use technology as a tool. And in the last few years, we've been we've been seeing a, a major uh, a, a jump in, in that in that evolution. I mean, from from the from the time when we cut tape in studios to uh, and I use Pro Tools as well, by the way. I mean, I, I, I'm a younger younger guy, probably. I, I'm technically a millennial, so I, I got into music at the time when computers were already pretty big. Um, but uh, but I got in Pro Tools because it was a necessity because a lot of studios use that as standard. So uh, to me, it was it was a natural progression to to get into Pro Tools. But uh, yeah, definitely, I'm actually curious about the time when 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 creative jobs will be taken by technology, <laughs> which will be maybe in the next few decades. We we don't know that. But um, but yeah, it's definitely. I think it's 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 a helpful tool, but too much of it can be can be deterring from from the actual goal of composing or the goal of creating. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you have to streamline yeah. what you're doing, and yeah. and also I think that knowing the technology really helps. I mean, I learned yeah. how to write music with pencil and and manuscript right. paper, right. and everything I used to write back when I did it that way sounded pedantic and studied. <laughs> And then since, you know, because I'm mostly, uh, when I play piano, I'm an improviser. I improvise, right. and to be able to jam ideas into the computer, even if it's an orchestral, orchestral music, which I do a lot of, um, and, and capture that and then be able to manipulate what I've done, right. um, it, really, it really has taken a whole step, mm -hmm. uh, or multiple steps away from just getting into the flow. Right. And for that flow, it's really... You need to simplify the process, probably. You know, in terms of a, you know, I can see you have a big studio behind you, but it's it's it, it's it, not it's not that big. It takes up a quarter <laughs> corner of my living room. Um, right. <laughs> seriously, it's it's, uh, it's it's 
not compared to what I used to have. I used to rent out right. a space in Midtown, and I had a whole room filled with racks and racks right. of samplers, right. like, you know, eight or nine. Yeah, it used to be a necessity, yeah. Yeah, and now I've got uh, three computers networked together, and I can make ten times the sound of, as as right. 15, fifteen samplers, you know, all in the box. Yeah. At a fraction yeah. of the price too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, although sample libraries can add up. Um, That's true. Uh, especially if you do a lot of orchestral music, the cost of them can really add up over over time. So, do you guys ever feel that that the technology? Kind of, do you ever get caught up in the technology, or was there a point in time, and while you were, you know, shifting from what was to what is now, that you started playing with all the bells and whistles, and then had to draw back from that? Has that ever been a, a roadblock at all? I've I've definitely been blocked off by by too much technology. Yes, it, it happens constantly, actually, <laughs> <laughs> and I constantly have to. You know, I think it was Billy Howard of, of a Perfect Circle that when he was creating his album at his at his, his place. Um, he had to really uh, 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 close himself off and, and just a couple of plugins and Pro Tools and just a, a few pieces of rack gear uh, in order to streamline his process and, and, and to not get lost in, in, in just, just fiddling with technology. And that I think that's an important point. Yeah, definitely. I get lost a lot of times, and, and instead of creating, I just fiddle. <laughs> just <pretty bad. laughs> I, think, I think personally speaking, having deadlines, mm -hmm. hard deadlines, like an air date for something, uh, is really great at helping you streamline your process. Like when you have to be done by X date. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you you just you know you go with you go with what you have to go with, and you ha you make hard decisions. I always find that that extra um, two or three hours I might spend on a small little section. Sometimes it makes a big difference, but a lot of times it's just it's wasted time because you it it becomes. It, it, it loses the feeling because you're over uh, over over manipulating mm -hmm. uh, the, the the sound, and you lose like the raw feeling of the um, of performance. So, Pete, do you think that that you know, I mean, you said that you came from starting with uh, you know pencil and paper. Did that kind of stuff start to happen when you had the ability to make those adjustments with within shorter amounts of time? Meaning, like before with pen and paper or pencil and paper, you'd be like, "Well, gosh, that would take way more time than I have available to me." But now with technology, you know, you really could go, "Oh, well, shoot, I probably could make it happen. I've got a little bit of time." Do you feel more tempted now than you were before, or or is that not relevant? You know, let me answer that by saying that I I've, I've been writing music for since I was the little kid, you know, and I'm over 50 now, all right? And um, I think that what happens is that the law, if, and I've, I've, especially the last 15 years, I've had to deal with deadlines uh, on almost every project. Um, and sometimes I have to create massive amounts of music in a very short period of time. And I think that having that kind of pressure trains you to make quicker decisions and not deliberate over things incessantly and I think that that it develops a discipline and that sort of discipline has um, carried over into just regular work so like when I work on my albums I don't I don't go I don't go crazy with that um, I, I, I if and I find that so for example I was trying to learn how to use Sibelius this summer uh, earlier this summer because I wanted to print out some scores uh, to have people play some music and it, it started to bother me because it was just, there were certain things about it that they changed the, the they changed the structure of the screen where they they weren't pull down menus like on every other Macintosh program ev ever made, and they had everything and I was like it it, I, it was just incredibly frustrating because I had to actually sit and watch videos and I couldn't sort of f figure out something and then when I run into a roadblock, Google how do you do this and then watch something I had to start from scratch. I couldn't figure out how to even input notes, and you know, it, it just was really incredibly frustrating. <laughs> so, I, I, but, but getting back to the other point, I feel like having deadlines all the time really helps you to streamline your uh, creative process. Huh. So, it almost sounds like it'd be wise for one to, uh, even if they weren't working on a piece that had an actual deadline. I think the saying goes that 80% of everything, 80% of the activity happens in the last 20% of the time that you have to do it within. So it's almost like smart to 
put a deadline in, even though you don't actually have a deadline, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> force yourself into that discipline before someone forces you forces that discipline upon you. <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, it, it it really is easier said than done. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, in an ideal world. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about this? Maybe uh, Bruno or Jeremiah. I don't know if either of you have something to add on to that. But uh, if you do, great. If not, then why don't we move on to the second second topic? Or does somebody have anything to add on to that? So, uh, just to Pete's point, I mean, uh, I do interface design as well professionally, and yeah, I mean, when when a software changes in terms of interface, and you're looking for buttons, yeah, that's that's definitely frustrating, and it shouldn't happen, but sometimes it has to happen, I guess, because in audio uh, and in music composing, uh, things have changed in terms of a uh, workflow, uh, especially in the last in the last decade. So, uh, I, I guess musicians are still. Uh, Trying to keep up with with that kind of technological change and, and the workflow change that that encompasses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Nothing, as I was saying earlier, nothing more frustrating. You know, when you're in a flow of some idea, yeah. and we just want to yeah, get it out terrible. there. Yeah. Can't find the button or yeah. it used to be here, now it's over there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in terms of writing music to picture, Pete, you want to start off with this one. Um, well, I, I personally I love writing music to picture. It sort of t it it sort of takes you, for me personally, it takes me off into areas that I would not normally think about because, um, this you there's so many there's so many variables. You know the the, the actual um, picture determines your structure, so you may end up writing structurally instead of in measures of four and eight bars or two bars mm -hmm. you may write 11 beats um, you may write 15 beats you may write seven beats um, and then you have you know your phrases are all can can be different um, you, you also are dealing as part of a team which I really like um, and you have your department that you're dealing with and you interface with the director um, who has a vision and you, you want to support their vision and it, I just I find it really a, a really great um, art form, to be honest with you, craft art form, and one is something I really love doing. Do you prefer it? Prefer to write that way? Yeah, I actually do. Mm -hmm. Huh. Interesting. But then, but then, you know, I also prefer to sit down and just improvise at my instrument and capture that as recording, also. But that's kind of free form. Um, I find it much more difficult to just sit down and write music than uh, to have an image in front of me writing to. That's much, mm -hmm. much, much more inspiring to me. What do you think is, I mean, in regards to like the breakdown of, of how often you see which of which, do you, do you see the producers come in and say to you, Pete, here's a picture, write the music? Or do they send you an email or something that says, hey, this is the mood we're looking for. Send us a flavor of something or other. Would you find that there's, you know, more of one request than the other, or, or is it just kind of, is it, you know? Well, I find that when I first started writing music for music f professionally for media, I guess that's how I would describe it. I did a lot of production music work. Um, I wrote hundreds and hundreds of tracks for different libraries, for, for Fox, for NBC for Killer Tracks, which is a big production um, library that's now owned by Universal. Mm -hmm. And they would be, they would come to you and say that uh, we're putting together a CD of a motivational music or acid jazz or sports rock or um, uh, a solo ambient piano and, and then you would write <laughs> music with just using those descriptions. But now um, I don't do so much of that anymore. Um, it's almost, I would say, a vast majority of the projects I get in eventually end up with mu with picture to write to. I oh. sometimes sometimes uh, create a library of music for the filmmakers to cut to. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I did a project earlier this year that was on CNN in June, a documentary called 41 on 41, and uh, the filmmakers made the... Uh, did the opening credits and I scored the opening credits for them 
And then I used the themes in the opening credits, and I wrote about 35 or 40 minutes worth of music for them to use as they were cut, editing the rest of the film together. And then once they got the film edited, they would send me the sections, and then I'd rescore them uh, to picture because they would do funny edits because um, they... Because the you know the lib the, the library that I wrote didn't actually completely fit; it just gave them a template to cut to. Right. So I, I get combinations of the two, but it all right now it almost always ends up uh, to picture. Huh. Interesting. You know, and that kind of makes me think of another question. As you were talking, um, there's really been a huge shift from you know film, television, and the big addition I believe is video games. Mm -hmm. um, how have you seen that change the, how you write music, or has it? Is it still kind of the same process, I guess, for everybody on the panel, really? I personally have very little uh, experience writing video game music, so maybe somebody else can talk about it. I don't really know anything about how that's changed or evolved. I really have, to be honest, I have no experience doing that stuff. Uh, anybody else out there? <laughs> I have little experience as well. I, I, I've done voiceovers and, and and just music for iPad games, but uh, the process is completely different from, you know, if, if you talk about a big budget game, it's probably, I, I, I would imagine it would be more like like for film, like cutting for picture, but I'm, I'm not very sure. <laughs> I don't have the experience. Yeah, I, I don't have any experience uh, working with video games either, but from what I've seen and with a lot of the, the modern video games that are out today, they kind of, they, especially with the cutscenes in the video games, they do kind of emulate movies um, in a lot of ways. So it's there. There is a, a sense of <sighs> scorn to um, to picture as well with moving pictures. So it's uh, there are a lot of similarities, I would say, but uh, um, there are a lot of, are a lot of interactive elements as well. well of course, because you're in the game. Um, yeah, literally. <laughs> you, I mean, you know what I mean. Like there's there would be elements where. The, the the sound or the music would would depend on the the action of uh of the game so it's like that's another element that's mm -hmm. I guess would be taken into consideration sound design, yeah. huh. um, sound, design sound effects things like that but interesting yeah, it's pretty well fun. you know I guess that'll be I'll have to get some of the composers in from video game the video game uh, forums and whatnot <laughs> so yeah. I uh, certainly didn't it, want to it is it is a different animal oh yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to find out how that uh, that animal works <laughs> for writing. Of course, I would think that would be a challenge for you. What would you guys do? I suppose you'd say, "Hey, it's, you know, I haven't done a lot of it, but uh, you know, sign me up. I'll give it a shot." <laughs> would you do you think your approach would change at all, though, Pete? I don't know. I'd have to talk to some people that I know that did it first and get their experience and um, and and some advice from them. I I think that. You know, first of all, it's a generational thing. I'm a little old for video games, um, personally speaking. You know, I, I don't watch, I don't look at a lot of them. I'm not really that interested in them. Um, whereas films and movies, I'm very interested in, and I watch them a lot. Documentaries and films, um, I watch that stuff a lot because I enjoy it. Um, but one thing I do think that you have to do with the music for video games, I think you have to write it in kind of a modular way, where um, things can cut quickly, and there can be juxtapositions uh, when you go from one if one one event to another event. So I think that you probably have to take a lot of that into consideration when you're writing. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Bruno, I wanted to get your thoughts on writing music to picture, if you have some. Uh, and Jeremiah. Yeah, I, well. I, <laughs> uh, I oh. feel that it's. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go no, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Was oh, it Bruno or Jeremiah? Sorry, I'm confused now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I find that it's a lot easier, at least for me, to 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 write a picture. Um, partially the reasons Pete mentioned as well. Uh, I feel that you know having that that visual um, mood uh, uh, helps me, and also I make decisions that that uh, that I would not make if I was improvising my instrument. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I it, it's interesting though. It, the final result tends to be uh, a lot more musical than I imagined at first, in the sense that you know I'll, I'll cut things to the picture. It, sometimes too much following the picture, um, which is a mistake that I did, especially in the beginning. Um, and uh, it, but in the end, playing the track, it actually you know it sounds like something that was actually improvised, and 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 it stands alone. So it's it, it's an interesting experience to see that transformation, um, for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> 
you said you fell into some traps. What, what, what were those traps when writing to picture? <laughs> um, definitely, especially with Disney, it's 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 very um, it it was it was hard for me initially to avoid the mistake of you know of of, of making music that exactly follows the picture, almost like cartoony, uh -huh. <laughs> almost like Warner Brothers cartoons, um, okay. <laughs> and and uh, and it, it was a mistake that eventually you know I, I caught up with and 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 I stopped doing it, but. Uh, uh, definitely, I don't. I don't know if it's if it's exactly a mistake. I would say it's it's a stylistic uh, option that that uh, that probably is not used anymore as much because I mean, a composer should should make music that 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 does not interfere with with with, with the picture. Does not interfere with the story in the sense that you know it, it doesn't get in the way. Right. But uh, uh, and that sometimes can get in the way just because you know because the the, the audio is there to remind you of, of what what actions are taking place. So uh, that could be a mistake, and I consider that a mistake sometimes. But I don't know; I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> did you discover it on your own, or is it? Uh, did somebody say? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, no, actually, there was not a lot of feedback from from producers at the time, and and I was working with a composer here in South Pasadena, Nathan Wang, and there was there was some mild feedback feedback about that and changing some keys sometimes a bit mid scene, uh, but. Uh, not exactly the, the 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 feedback about you know falling too much the picture that was that was that was mostly my decision to uh, to not exactly uh, copy that kind of uh, you know old style um, uh, orchestral uh, 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 to picture coordination I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, to come up with a, a a vocabulary word for that, <laughs> <laughs> right? What are that maybe? Time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Jeremiah, any thoughts on your end? I I have not. I have no experience with uh, writing um, to to motion picture, but it's. I mean, it seems like oh, it's. A, I'm used to write to making the music first and then adding video to it. That's what I've been doing lately. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I guess you can call it music videos. I've been I've been getting clips of like uh, B-roll and just. Um, Adding it to uh, to the music, so that's that's like the opposite, I guess, of uh, of what what uh, you're saying, which is I like suppose, yeah. the, the picture first and then adding music to that. Um, that seems that's very interesting to me, and that's why I mean that's you know I I'd, I'd like to uh, get into that, and um, but yeah, I I've never done it, I haven't done it yet, so I mean I guess I should practice, and you guys seem like you're giving some good advice on this. <laughs> You have to set a deadline is, is what we've taken away thus far. <laughs> yeah, one other, thing, one other thing I'd like to add about um, working on films is that a lot of people, I think today more than ever, have incredibly varied interests and musical tastes. Mm. Mm. Um, and film is a great way to be able to explore those different sides of you. You know, because every film has a different approach so in the last two years I scored um, a documentary for ESPN that uh, used all Delta Blues acoustic guitar slide music um, I did a, a film for Oprah's channel a documentary for them uh, that used a lot of African rhythms um, and then the film I did earlier this year was uh, for CNN was um, very orchestral Americana, almost Copeland-esque, mm -hmm. and then the uh, that stop animation film I just finished was very spooky, you know, some very um, dissonant orchestral music as well. So you get to explore different avenues of uh, your creative creativity uh, in a way that um, if you were just a solo artist making music, you might not be able to do because. You know, when you're a solo artist, you need to be marketed and put into a, a style. Um, it's very true. Yeah. Do you, any of you feel that now with Spotify and you know all the different you know avenues of music out there for people to pick and choose from, it seems that there's so many categories that someone could fall into. Do you feel? Um, Pete, I guess, do you feel that you get more requests for certain types of music that you wouldn't have thought of, people would have heard of that much of before due to the the great, what, diverseness of, of music that's available to, you know, readily be consumed right now? Not quite sure because um, 
No, no, I don't. Th I don't think so because I think I think that if people want something that's a specific genre, like a, a vocal song, they'll just go to try to get license out that vocal song, and that's pretty much a lot of what's on Spotify and this uh, is, and, and that's what most people that listen to those uh, stations they probably listen to vocal songs, mm. and uh, that's not sort of what I do. Um, I, I sort of have a like a, a steady group of people that I write for, and they, you know, they, they, they let their projects dictate what they do, and they let me sort of research the styles for them. Every once in a while, they'll come up with something, but it's not that far out. Huh. Cool. Interesting. Um, sorry, I, I hate to run, guys, but I have an appointment to get to you at 11, but thank you for letting me join. Thank you for letting me listen to you guys. Um, you know, I, I didn't have much to offer, but <laughs> I mean, it's great to meet you, Jeremiah. Thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you, gentlemen. Nice yeah. to meet you. Good job, good to have you on the show. Thank you. Ciao. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good. Well, that was that was good to uh, have some input on on all all kinds of things there. Um, uh, Bruno, did you have any thoughts on what we were just discussing discussing there? I'm sorry. Can you can you uh, what were we talking again? Uh, talking a no. little bit about. My train of thought was. Yeah, well, with all of the different uh, different styles of music that are right, that right. are easily to be heard and consumed mm -hmm. online, um, I was just curious to see if you've experienced more requests of different types of of music um, that you wouldn't have thought of people would have heard of before. <laughs> uh, definitely, especially recently, and, and and definitely, there's a lot of overlap in in in. A, in the music genres now, and, and I remember doing a lot of cues that that were eventually replaced, but by, by the music director, by just pop songs that were licensed. Mm -hmm. So, so I definitely saw that firsthand in terms of you know licensing and, and music library versus you know actual actual composed music for the for the actual picture. Um, and I think more and more we're going to see that. Uh, definitely, it's it's a tendency that seems to be growing, especially with with a lot of uh, online production and a lot of low budget stuff that 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 is now done. Uh, it, it just it just makes sense to do, and and it, it's funny. A lot of composers actually don't. Um, there seems to be a divide between composers who, who who still have the the budget and the deals to 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 work with full orchestras, and the ones who actually have to you know make basically mockups with with sample libraries at home. And 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 for the most part, that a lot of times that ends up in the picture. So uh, depending on 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 what what the budget is for that for that production, but uh, it's definitely fascinating. I had a discussion with the, with Hummy Man who who did music for uh, for Robin Hood Men in Tights, hmm. um, and uh, he's he, he seems to be very on the side of you know actual hiring musicians and 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 and. and um, Printing out scores and, and and recording everything just old old fashioned way, but uh, it definitely seems like a tendency that's that's uh, 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 reducing now and and uh, a lot more licensing now is happening, and mm. definitely that's 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 industry changing I think and and it has to do with technology partially probably, um, and it has to do with with just accessibility of, of of resources to people and and everyone wants to be creative now and. And everyone has the ability to be creative if they want to, because it's not it's not too expensive now, so right. they can do it as a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. In fact, you know that brings me to a question for you, Pete. Um, being that you've you know been around the block, you've had a lot of experience going back from before the time of of well, I wouldn't say before the time of computers, but you know back when your people were doing a lot of more scoring with pencil and paper. Do you find that? That uh, you, what I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this, but uh, now that that everybody can have a sampler in their phone, as opposed to spending you know 50 grand for a sampler in their studio, um, how have you seen that change the lineup of of composers and musicians out there, and how has that affected you, or has it? Well, you know, it. it it hasn't really affected me, to be honest with you, but I think that you can make, if you're a very creative person, per, there's not a standard solution mm -hmm. for every project. And if you're a creative person, you can come up with, with um, a couple of bells 
if yeah. it fits the project, it fits the project. A couple of bells and a couple of drumsticks, right? If that fits the video, the film, that fits the film. Um, so, uh, but what I would say though is, what I hear a lot of with people who do sample orchestral work is that um, there are some people who do it really, really well, mm. and then there are some people who do things in a way that an instrument normally wouldn't do mm -hmm. and sometimes that could be really cool you think mm -hmm. of something that like is not typical but a lot of times it it doesn't sound good um, and uh, I've been very fortunate that I've played in orchestras for 25 years um, so I know what a French horn sounds like because I sat next to one for 10 years or, or trumpets or string players I've had I've sat in string sections and played orchestral you know, string parts on keyboards, trying to fill out the string section, learning how to phrase with them, and breathe with them, and woodwinds, and all that stuff. And it, there's so much um, animation that goes on in the production of a sound by an acoustic player. And in order for you to do that with a sample-based library, you have to make uh, really detailed use of continuous controller information, uh -huh. because a lot of the great sample libraries have all sorts of interesting stuff programmed in like the mod wheel for example where you can not just get louder and softer but you can do crescendos and decrescendos through the different velocity layers of the sound very smoothly using a mod wheel and then you can draw in stuff with the expression controller and uh, the lengths of notes learning that like a person needs to take a breath if they're playing a flute and they can't play for five minutes <laughs> um, so stuff like that um, I find that when I listen to, and also a lot of people when they write parts, they write parts like keyboard keyboard parts translated out to other instruments, and that to me always sounds bad. Um, I hear that a lot, um, <laughs> but but by the same token, somebody could take these same sounds that has no training, and if they're a very creative person, they can come up with something that you've never thought of before, um, and it might be very valid for whatever they're working on. So. Uh, there's two sides to that coin. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've had this conversation with uh, photographers um, as of late, just out on shoots and whatnot, and very similar things. You know, saying, as I always say, the best camera is the one you have in your pocket. But people were originally thinking, oh man, everybody's got a camera and I can take pictures now. That makes me a photographer. I'm going to, you know, it makes everybody a photographer. I might lose business. But the feedback I'm getting from different areas is that people realize that maybe they're just not that good of a photographer so the needs of a professional photographer actually are augmented <laughs> which I thought was an interesting reversal <laughs> so um, let me segue to one last question here um, and it actually kind of hits a little bit on what you talking about Pete but in regards to communicating um, methods when working with non-musical creatives what uh, challenges have you had with that, or what's what's your what's your take? I, I know that was an input uh, that was input by you, Pete. So why don't you lead off with that that one? Okay, um, it's interesting because I'm teaching a class this semester in uh, Film Scoring Foundations, and um, I'm having some directors come out to sit in the class so that the students can actually see how. Uh, we interact together so that they can learn because most of them are going to be working with beginning filmmakers mm -hmm. and you know 15 years ago when I first started scoring films I started getting independent films with people that this was their first film that they made and one thing that they do really badly in film schools is they ne they don't really discuss the use of mus music with directors in a film right so people get get out and you're dealing with directors making their first film and they've got music up there from like 20 or 30 different sources and there's no continuity to it at all. Uh, I remember one film I scored, the guy, the guy had all these temp music and it went from Thelonious Monk and Nina Simone to Peter Gabriel um, to Portishead. Uh, I mean, the music was all over the place, and it was very difficult, and, and it was very hard for him to let go of that temporary score that he had on there, and for me to tr I was trying to learn to communicate to him that we have to have something, you know, that ties this all together, and it ended up that the score ended up being a little bit more piecemeal than I would like, but 
what I found generally is that if you're a musician and you're talking with somebody who's not a musician, you can't talk music terms to them. <laughs> right? You have to talk in adjectives and descriptions. And it's your job as a composer to take the adjectives and descriptions of, let's say, they're talking moods uh, or whatever, um, and turn that into music. Hmm. So, Pete, I know there's going to be directors and producers who are going to watch the replay of this. Could you give us some examples <laughs> of uh, what you're talking about there with in regards to changing it from music 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 knees <laughs> to uh, to the the conversation that other people could understand? Yeah, so you wouldn't talk to somebody that, um, well, I'm doing a dodecaphonic tritone um, <laughs> inversion of the, uh, you know, the hexachord. <laughs> so directors, beware. If you hear this conversation... <laughs> But what they might, what they might say to me is, this needs to be eerie and scary, and there needs to be a rhythmic pulse. There needs to be a pulse thing going on, and uh, the the woman, they, they, you need to talk about the intent behind the the scene, you know. So um, while they're in the scene here, and the guy is is looking at the uh, the unfoldings, and he's remembering something from his childhood. So there needs to be something in here that's innocent but yet haunting at the same time. And so you you learn to have a communication with them, and what that means to one person, one director might be something completely different to another director, you know? So that's part of your job as a composer is to learn those differences and learn how to translate that stuff. So do you ever ask them to qual to uh, qualify or, or clarify, I should say, in regards to when they say haunting and daring? Do you say, okay, exactly what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I, don't qu I don't know if that's like a really um, tactful way to put it, you know, I would, I would, you know, you really seriously, a lot of a lot of being successful in this industry is is communication and learning how to communicate with people, uh, in a way that you can get stuff out of them. Because ultimately, your job as a composer is really to do what they want, right? Um, and to give them what they need for their film. I I, I don't worry about putting my own personal stamp on anything because the, just the fact that I'm doing it is going to do that. Um, but you really, that's that's your job as part of the team is to like support what their vision is. And you know, you could you could ask them to play you music that they like, and ask them to mm -hmm. tell you what they like about the music, and you see what kind of terms they use to describe that music, and and you put that in your brain, and you remember that. You know, there's all sorts of little things that you can do, but I I, I wouldn't like really want to put them on the spot. Well, what do you mean by that? I know that that's <laughs> that's not. I, I know that that's not what you meant. Right, exactly. Then, but but there is a, a art to communicating with somebody, and it's not in an insincere way. It's just you really want to find out what they want, and right. you need to make them feel comfortable to talk to you because it might be intimidating for them to, to talk to somebody, a, a, you know, a musician that knows all these terms and all this stuff uh, that they don't know. And I have had compose, uh, uh, filmmakers start to talk like that, and I've had to say, well, you know, well, then a piece of music you like that does sort of that for you, you know, or, or think about, you know, think about it in a different way. Try to explain it to me with emotions and feelings or what's the psychology of what's going on here now. You know, so you, you really have to develop those communication skills. It's really important. Wow. That's, I hadn't really thought about that. I hadn't really thought about, <clears throat> about how your job as a composer is to get inside the head of the the you know whatever their needs are and really draw those needs outside of them and then fulfill them as the composer. That's an interesting point. And yeah, and you have to do it in a in a way that they feel comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I can totally. And, and that doesn't mean that they're you're not going to have differences of opinion or discussions or debates or anything like that. It just means that really your job is to like translate what they're saying in English mm -hmm. into sound. You know, it's very true. Interesting, Bruno. Bruno do you have any? Uh, no, I, I absolutely agree. It's it's you're, very you're true. You're nodding and smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually it, it's true that um, I'm a visual person, so I I also try to speak in terms of a you know use adjectives that are independent from from a, musical terms. Um, I, I actually find myself using a lot of a lot of visual um, uh, uh, terms to describe. Uh, uh, Musical stuff, you know. I see. Oh, see that. See that. See that. You know, 
that stuff when I, when I really mean, did you hear that? <laughs> oh, well. So I guess it's a little synesthetic of me in that sense, but uh, but yeah, it's true that it's, it's one thing that's frustrating, design and, and art and, and music, is that uh, people have opinions about it. So y you will hear a, a director, a music director, um, uh, speak to you in terms of uh, you know what they think of the music, as if you know as if they actually understand exactly what they want there. But a lot of times people don't know what they want there. They, they want to hear an example. They they want to they want to hear uh, your creation first, and, and then they can they can pick and choose. Then then they can they can try to modify it and try to. I, I find that a lot, especially in design too. It's 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 constantly a struggle with the. Communication until you have a, a, a mock-up done or, or, or a certain amount of work done, and then everyone starts going back and, 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 and evaluating things and, and, and criticizing, and and then you start having that. But there's there's a, there's a name for that, uh, especially when, when people have uh, uh, um, when it's things that are tangible to people, like music, like like visuals. Uh, everyone in the world has an opinion about it. And uh, and that opinion will come through when 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 they try to uh, try to explain to you what they want. So uh, it's it, that makes it complicated because I just think it's it it ends up always being a back and forth inevitably, uh, in the sense that I'll create something and uh, and I'll have to get feedback in order to to steer my direction and actually know where to go next and and what to modify uh, if something needs to be modified. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, why don't we do? Yeah, that was no, it was definitely. Are we out of time? My head, no, 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 my head's spinning with all the uh, the information. You guys me. This is great. <laughs> um, but uh, why don't we do this? Why don't Why don't we end on that note? And or if Pete, if you have anything to add on that, but I I do want to find out, uh, Bruno. I I asked Pete what he was working on at the beginning of this uh, interview. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get a chance to ask you what uh, what you're working on, or if you have anything mm -hmm. forthcoming in the pipeline, anything that you're working on that maybe you can tell us about. <laughs> maybe something I shouldn't say yet, but um, I'm actually working with a band called Black Lab, and I've I've worked with them as orchestrator uh, and arranger for for the last two three albums that that, that, that they've released. But uh, there might be one new album coming next year uh, that has a, a quite a lot of orchestral uh, parts. So. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe I, I shouldn't have said that, probably, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's 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 what's up and coming. Well, <laughs> just where, any kind of band. Where can people find out more about you, Bruno? Is there a certain website you want to send them to, or? Uh, yeah, I have I have a, a design website, BrunoSarage.com, which has some music work as well. Okay. Um, and Why don't you spell uh, that out for us. Br uh, Bruno, uh, like Bruno Mars, Bruno S E R G E dot com. Okay. And uh, I'll be updating that very soon with, with probably some new music and, and some new other work, other creative work, visual mostly. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Pete, I know that uh, you've got your 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 uh, web address right there listed. But is there uh, any more information or some other, some other place you want to send people to or something they should? Uh, you, you can find me on Twitter, uh, and you could find me on Facebook. So send me friend requests, um, and um, I have YouTube. I'm all. I'm on the. I'm all over the web. Uh, there's several. There's several Peter Calandras, but uh, mm -hmm. just, you know, the one for the musician is the one to search for. Okay. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> well, that's awesome. It's certainly a pleasure to uh, to have both of you guys on the show. And uh, Jeremiah earlier uh, would love to have both of you back for more conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, moving forward, we're going to be doing more, doing more of these conversations. Um, and uh, would love to have both of you back on the show. Would that be all right sometime? Sounds good to me. Absolutely, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Anything anybody want to add? Just thank you for having us on. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Well, thank you, Peter, Bruno. Make it a great day, and we'll uh, see you on the next show or see you on the site or see you online somewhere. <laughs> great. Okay, thanks a lot. See you then. Thanks. Have, a great day. Have a great day. You too.